Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Back in Business, the first episode of NLEC-PH web series made possible by our episode partners, Live Events and GLPS Co. Episode partners for production and creatives, Creative Manila, Strat Minds Events, Saga Events, and Extreme Manila. I'm Lexi Schultz. I'll be joining you tonight as we discuss how the industry can re- the normal. And join us in this episode. The web series was supposed to air earlier today, but due to technical glitches, and like PH decided to move it to tonight. One of the objectives of the web series is to create learning opportunities for everyone in the industry. And with that in mind, and like deemed it was necessary to post the show, our learning won't be interrupted and you get the most out of your discussions. Now, what happened earlier is just one of the challenge live industry faces as we pivot to digital platforms. Tonight, we'll dive into these roadblocks, learn from experiences, and come out of this episode equipped and prepared. This evening, we will be joined by representatives from the Department of Labor and Employment. From the Department the industry's primary concerns regarding the safety of our walls and modify specific standard operating procedures to follow government-approved methods in the hopes of helping you make sound decisions for your next event. Now, we aim for this episode to be a collaborative and learning opportunity for all. And as we start our learning and unlearning, we encourage everyone to keep an open mind. Take in and sit through all the insights that will be shared today and modify them to fit your situation. Our discussions are guidelines that are for your consideration and planning. And most importantly, we want you to discuss how today's presentations can improve our industry culture and strengthen our relationship with each stakeholder. Now, you feel free to also invite your friends and colleagues to watch so we can all learn together. The comment section is open for your questions, clarifications, feedback, or suggestions for the topics that you want to be discussed in the next episodes. We will also try our best to answer them given the time that we have. Our current situation calls for us to re-evaluate the live events industry. National Live Events Coalition Philippines was formed to ensure that no freelancer, supplier, talent, organizer, or agency is ever left behind through NLEC. The voices of the people behind the scenes are echoed to spark a national conversation. Today is just one of the testaments that you are heard, and the national government is working with and for our industry's great comeback. To start the discussion, let us please welcome the Interim Vice President of NLEC-PH, Mr. Dennis Maras. Good evening. Welcome to the first of a series of webinars organized by the National Live Events Coalition, PH. These webinars are intended to equip ourselves with knowledge and insights that can help the live events industry as we weather the pandemic and prepare for the new normal, which we hope will come sooner rather than later. The pandemic and the resulting lockdown has actually given us a chance to come together and take stock of our industry. Even as we launch these webinars tonight, other activities are ongoing aimed at strengthening our relationships with various offices of government and allied fields in the private sector. Arts and entertainment activities are the hardest hit among all the sectors of society and it is expected that as work resumes, live events will be the last to come back. But expect live events to be back. And in preparation and anticipation of that moment, experts in our field have been busy preparing a reopening guide. Phase one and phase two have been completed, produced by event professionals with the guidance of the interagency task force and in accordance and fully compliant with the interim guidelines on workplace prevention and control of COVID-19 of the departments of trade and industry, labor and employment, and health. With the support of uh, this and other government agencies, the next step is figuring out how to get out back there safely. But safety is not the concern of one person or one department alone. For us to be able to reopen the industry and reopen safely, 
all stakeholders must recognize that their roles extend to ensuring everyone else's safety. The times call for us to learn and to learn with stakeholders as we venture toward our industry's new normal. This series of webinars is just a step in our learning process, hoping to help effectively communicate, reach out, and learn together as an industry. We hope that you will find these webinars helpful and perhaps more importantly, inspiring. So on behalf of the National Live Events Coalition, PH, thank you for joining us. We make events, we matter, and we will be back out there and we will be safe. Good evening to everyone. All right, once again, thank you very much for that, Mr. Dennis Marasigan. You said some really powerful statements that we matter, that we will be back out there, and that we will be safe. If you're just tuning in, this is the first episode of the NLEC PH web series. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a jam packed discussion ahead, so be sure to stick around. Even before the pandemic, live events was not a government recognized industry. The people behind the gig economy were initially not included in the beneficiaries of the financial assistance given by government. With a continuous rallying of the alliance, we found an ally in our next speaker. He is the representative of the 4th District of Pangasinan in the lower house. Sitting as the deputy majority leader, he is a member of numerous committees, notably the Committee on Basic Education and Culture and Committee on Tourism. Everyone, please welcome Congressman Christopher De Venecia. Thank you, Lexi, for that kind introduction. Uh, to the distinguished panelists joining us today, Chair Lisa Dino, Dino Seguera, Chairperson and CEO of the Film Development Council of the Philippines, Dr. Marco Antonio S. Valeros, CFP MPA Medical Officer, of the Bureau of Working Conditions from the Department of Labor and Employment, Mr. Nicanor Bon, Chief Labor and Employment Officer, Division Bureau of Working Conditions from the Department of Labor and Employment, Dr. Beverly Lorraine Siho, Medical Director, Health Promotion Bureau from the Department of Health, to the leaders, officers, and members of the National Live Events Coalition Philippines, who put together this series of amazing panels to the stakeholders in the live events industry and to everyone watching this web series from all over the country. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm pleased to virtually welcome you all to the first ever episode of the web series by the National Live Events Coalition PH entitled Back in Business. Creative industry form the socio-economic bedrock of most progressive countries around the world. We look towards the experiences of countries like South Korea, the United Kingdom, the rest of the European Union, the Americas, some of our neighboring countries in the ASEAN, and the greater Pacific region on how they've galvanized their creative industries towards socio-economic growth. It's interesting to note as well that the creative industry experience of South Korea started in the wake of the 1997 Asian financial crisis under the leadership of Kim Dae-jung as the nation started pivoting towards new growth areas and capitalizing on its inherent strengths, innovation, and creativity. As propelled by the intensive studies of the Creative Economy Council of the Philippines, headed by the great Paolo Mercado, we have come to arrive at the following assumptions. One, that creative economy is an economy based on original and innovative ideas that generate value through the trade and exchange of products or goods, services, content, and intellectual property. Number two, that its core sectors include art, design, entertainment, media, and innovation, 
Yes, this includes science and technology. It's no wonder that even when the Duterte administration crafted its 10-point socioeconomic agenda, creative arts was aggregated with science and technology at number eight. Number three, the global estimates of this burgeoning industry is a 2.3 trillion US dollars and employs about 30 million workers and is a sector growing faster than agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Number four, that Asia Pacific is among its biggest contributors led by China, Japan, and of course, South Korea. And that within the ASEAN, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia have made creative economy a top priority by establishing formal government structures and strategic roadmaps that would provide an enabling environment for private public partnerships to drive socioeconomic transformation and accelerated growth. Number five, that in the Philippines, creative industries have been thriving independently of each other and with little to no support from the public sector. And number six, that the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, reports that our creative exports are at 3.2 billion US dollars in creative services, making the Philippines number one in the ASEAN region. Though there's need for more improvement in our creative goods sector, which stands at only 915 million US dollars. The recommendation from creative industry experts is that we double down on the Philippines' comparative advantage, that is, in the creative services sector, to which live events belongs, while not losing sight of bolstering the sale, scale, and export of our creative goods. The live events industry firmly and indefatigably belongs to the unique, albeit still broad, dispersed, and undefined ecosystem of our creative economy. This is something that we in Congress are endeavoring to solidify and figure out in the next two years through legislation, oversight, and constant consultation and collaboration with stakeholders in the public and the private sector. During these distressing times, I'm comforted by the fact that the resiliency of the live events industry pushes on. Though the pandemic has given us a lot of unprecedented struggles, this industry is also said to be the last to bounce back and recover. However, the sector has continuously showed initiative and advocated solutions and policy recommendations to aid and innovate the sector and move the industry forward. It goes without saying, that coping with economic repercussions of COVID-19 has not been easy for all those affected. For what it's worth, I hope you find solace in the fact that you have an ally or a group of allies in Congress who will hear out your concerns and champion policies that will help you not only survive the pandemic, but thrive beyond it. Together, we can pursue short-term, medium-term, and long-term changes that will help the creative economy reach its fullest potential. Of course, it's no secret that most of the workforce in the live events industry belong to the freelance sector or the gig economy. So when Arise or the stimulus bill was being deliberated in Congress through NLEC's successful lobbying, it was able to solidify a provision granting for wage subsidies to freelancers all the way to its third and final reading. The same was included through FDCP and NLEC's intensive lobbying in the Senate, even expanding the scope of the subsidy and directing the DILG and the Anti-Red Tape Authority to look into the relaxation of the prohibitive amusement tax that has imperiled the live events industry more so today in the climate of the new normal. I have also witnessed firsthand how NLEC has persevered in reaching out to government agencies like the Department of Tourism, the Department of Trade and Industry, the Film Development Council of the Philippines, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the Department of Health, 
the Department of Labor and Employment, and many other agencies in order to build rapport and establish awareness of this industry that was most heavily impacted by COVID-19. But more than all that, it was able to establish representation. In matters of policy, it's about being in the room where it happens, as quoted from the musical Hamilton, and having a voice. Today, because of NLEC, the live events industry has a voice and is finally heard. As somebody who firmly believes in the power of industry and the private sector to work hand in hand with government, albeit socially distanced for now, to recharter our nation's trajectory towards business unusual, where creative industries are finally at the forefront, you can be certain that you will have an ally in Congress rooting for you and helping you as best I can every step of the way. We in Congress are currently working on a portfolio of measures to ensure the welfare of creative industries and its workers like the live event sector. A freelance protection bill, which has been consolidated alongside other bills in the technical working group and will now be presented to the committee, aims to provide protection and welfare to freelancers who comprise majority of the live events workforce. This is also an opportunity to help migrate our heroic workers to join the formal economy. A measure intended to formally restructure the amusement tax to be more favorable towards stakeholders in the creative industry. Another measure to institutionalize cultural heritage mapping in the LGUs upon which they can exact ideas for their socioeconomic agenda, like tourism programs, festivals, and the like. Several measures in support of the screen sector as well as the music sector, and many others that are emerging with each of our consultations. Be that as it may, I cannot stress enough how vital NLEC has been in providing leadership during these crucial times. Leadership. I can't stress this word enough. Leadership, leadership, leadership. It is what is going to get the live events industry through this pandemic into the new normal and whatever situation comes its way in the future. And I am honored and proud and humbled to be working with NLEC as a policymaker, as a collaborator, as a stakeholder, and as a friend. Before I end, I'd like to leave everyone with a quote from William Blake, an English poet. According to him, what is now proved was once only imagined. Thus, to the live events industry, continue to imagine and prove what you are capable of. It all, it all boils down to leadership, and NLEC is certainly not lacking in this regard. Again, congratulations, and I look forward to the rest of these web episodes. May it be of service and help to you, the viewers, and to everyone as well. Good evening. With that, we'd like to thank you very much, Congressman Toth Devanesha. Again, we'd like to say hello to all of our viewers out there. And in our first discussion, we will be tackling the safety measures that stakeholders must take to resume office operations. This discussion highlights the responsibilities and roles of both the employers and the employees in ensuring a safe working environment following the government sanctioned guidelines. Our first speaker is a member of the Technical Working Group on Drafting Dole Policies on IRR of the Occupational Safety and Healthy Law, Health Law and the Dole DTI Guidelines for COVID-19. Here's Medical Officer 4 of the Bureau of Working Conditions of the Department of Labor and Employment, Dr. Marco Antonio Valeros. Good afternoon, partners. I am here to discuss how do we apply OSH in the new normal setting. Business for some essential goods and services has started, and I am positive that the live events would follow suit. But as of now, I understand that the back office uh, operation has started. So I think uh, this presentation will still be useful for them and, and for the future uh, ones that uh, the live events would be allowed to operate. So 
here in my first slide, uh, you can see here the provisions in the Philippine 1987 Philippine Constitution on safety and health of our workers. So we have at least three provisions here that uh, provides for the protection uh, and humane working conditions for uh, our country's workers. So we have uh, at least three legal bases here uh, in the slides. We have, of course, as mentioned, the 1987 Philippine Con Constitution, the Labor Code of the Philippines, particularly Book 4, and its IRR, Occupational Safety and Health Standards. And for this uh, presentation, of course, I am citing at least for related laws and issuances that is uh, COVID-19 related. Number one is RA 11058, ito po yung OSH law, 11165, the Telecommuting Act. Of course, 11036, yung Mental Health Act and DTI dollar and killing guidelines for COVID-19. So why 11165 is a Telecommuting Act? Okay. Kahit po naka-work from home, ang mga kumpanya ay nire-require pa rin na yung mga workers po nila ay magkaroon pa rin po na occupational safety and health program. So, what is OSH standards? Ito po yung mandatory rules sa occupational safety and health which codifies all safety orders issued prior to its promulgation. So, inipon po lahat ito at ipinartern po mula po sa standards ng mga developed na mga bansa. Ang uh, primary objective po nito, of course, is the pro for the protection of all workers. When we say all workers, wala po tayong, it cuts all, ano, no? uh, all types of workers, no? walang boundaries. Uh, kay private yan, kay public, kay formal, informal, even po yung mga freelancers, pasok po dyan. Ano? Dapat, dapat protected po kayo. Okay? Uh, of course, ang coverage, all work places. Ayan. So, dito po, uh, kahit po ang dole, limited lang po yung jurisdiction namin pagdating po sa batas kasi nagkikater lang kami sa private uh, companies pero po, um, sa public sector naman, ay nariyan naman po yung Civil Service Commission at pagdating naman po sa mga formal informal, marami pong ahensya na gobyerno na nagtutulong-tulong po sa inyo, even yung mga freelancers po I think may mga batas po tayong nakahain na para po sa inyo. So ito po yung mga duties and rights po ng mga manggagawa, no? mga workers alike at of course yung mga employers. Sa employers po, para po sa kanila, nire-require po sila ng batas na mag-provide ng capacity building. When say capacity building, it refers to orientation, to trainings, yan ng mga empleyado nila. Uh, provide information on occupational safety and health. Okay, kay IEC material yan, uh, kahit po webinar, okay, kailangan na maiprovide po yan sa kanila. Okay, yung mga devices at equipment na gagamitin, dapat pasado po yan sa industry standards, no? So, sa mga uh, sa live events, no, kung gumagamit po tayo ng mga scaffoldings, dapat po ay uh, nasa standards po yung mga diameter po yan, yung magtatayo niyan, dapat po ay uh, Tesla accredited, no? meron siyang NC2, uh, Certified Erector. Pagdating naman po sa mga PPE, dapat appropriate siya. Uh, of course, libre. Wala po dapat na ilalabas na gastusin yung mga workers pagdating po sa personal protective equipment. Ano naman po yung mga karapatan po ng manggagawa, sangayon po sa batas. Of course, karapatan po nila malaman ang iba't ibang uli po ng hazards po no? sa kanila pong pinagtatrabahuhan. Uh, maprovidean po sila ng training, education, at orientation on occupational safety and health Refu to refuse unsafe work in cases of imminent danger to report accidents and dangerous occurrences. Ayan. So bago po ito sa batas po dati kasi uh, yung mga safety officers po ang nag-report uh, po sa amin pero dito po in-empower na po sila. Okay? So, ito naman po yung silent features ng Department Order 198. Actually, ito po yung IRR ng OSH law, yung 11058. Dito po, nire-require po yung establishment na mag-develop po at mag-implement ng mga occupational safety and health program. Okay, so sa so mga nakapagpasa na po sa amin, no, sa, do, sa DOLE, 
uh, nire-require po kayo na i-update po siya to include yung uh, yung COVID-19 na ano, program. How do we address that? Okay? Ang um, National uh, Live Events Coalition of the Philippines naman ay meron po silang manual at uh, maganda na i-partner nyo po doon yung mga gagawin nyo pong programa. All covered workplaces shall have qualified OSH personnel for the following. Una po, safety officer, physician, dentist, nurse, and uh, first aiders. Yung number and type of OSH personnel po, nakabase po yan sa, sa risk, no? sa hazard risk nung, ano, nung kumpanya. Kung low risk siya, medium risk, kung high risk. Okay? Mas maraming empleyado, mas, mara, mas mataas yung risk niya, mas marami pong mga occupational safety and health personnel na kailangan. Bakit po naka-highlight itong safety officer po natin? Pagdating po kasi sa COVID, napakalaki po ng role po niya. Siya po yung parang chief implementer ng batas po no? sa workplace. Siya yung uh, titingin kung napapatupad ba ng maayos yung mga programa. Okay? So, formation of health and safety committee. Kailangan din naman, of course, ng safety officer natin ang katuwang sa pag implement ng batas, pag gagawa ng mga polisiya. Requirement din po sa batas na mag-submit po tayo ng report sa DOLE. At of course, pagdating po dito sa penalty provision, we also reserve po yung uh, pag i po nito sa mga employer na matitigas ang ulo. No? Yung mga na call mo na yung attention and yet, hindi pa rin po nagpa-follow sa recommendation. Ang tawag po sa batas doon, yung willful failure to comply with the requirements of the law. For as long as wala naman pong namatay, walang nagkasakit po ng malubha, na, dis, na, na disgrasya ng malubha, wala naman po tayong pag-uusapan po na multa kasi uh, kami po sa DOLE, uh, of course yung DTI pagdating po sa COVID-19, we are more, more of yung sa assistive o yung pagre-render po ng technical assistance po. No? Pero of course, kailangan din talaga na mag-follow po ng... Uh, sa recommendation po namin ang mga establishment. Okay? Pagdating naman po dito sa Joint and Solidary Liability, I was happy no, nang nabrowse ko po kasi yung manual ng NLEC uh, PH, nakita po natin doon na pati mga contractors at subcontractors ay inuobliga po nila na sumunod po no, sa mga regulations, sa protocols na inilatag po nila. Tama naman po iyon kasi po sangayon po sa batas kapag uh, ikaw ay uh, principal, meron ka mga contractor at subcontractor at kapag ka itong mga contractors at subcontractors mo ay hindi po sumusunod sa batas, no? maaari pong madamay ka pag ikaw ang principal. So maganda po no? na meron tayong tinatawag po no? na self-regulation sa loob po ng kumpanya na hindi na kinakailangan pang pumasok ni Dole ng DTI o kung kahit po ng LGU o kung sino man po yung mga regulators para mapasunod po natin ang mga uh, employer po, even yung mga workers po na hindi po sumusunod sa mga alitintunin po ng batas. So dito na po tayo no, sa components of DTI, Dole Interim Guidelines for COVID-19. So ito po yun, ano? number one, of course, increase physical and mental resilience. We take cognizance, of course, of the uh, holistic nature of man. Ano? Hindi lamang po yung physical, uh, we also consider yung mental uh, well-being ng mga individuals. No? So dito po, even yung mental health, uh, idinidiin po natin na dapat kasama po ito sa programa po nila. Of course, kasama din po dito yung pag how do we reduce yung transmission sa COVID-19. So prior sa entrance ng building, meron po tayong no, uh, no mask, no entry policy. Uh, pag accomplish po ng health symptom questionnaire, uh, pagkuha ng temperature. Of course, may isolation area wherein yung mga nadidetect na parang may mga sakit, uh, hindi pwedeng pumasok, uh, temporarily ilalagay doon before sila ma-assess ng clinic staff nila. At uh, of course, yung mga disinfectant footbats na sa entrance. Okay, inside the workplace, of course, dapat may disinfection protocol. Yung mga high-touch areas, tulad ng doorknobs, telephone, dapat uh, every two hours at a minimum nalilinis siya. Availability of sufficient clean water and soap sa washroom nila. Sa availability of sanitizers sa mga high traffic areas, tulad ng mga nabanggit dito sa screen. Yung physical distancing at a minimum, it should be at least one meter. No? 
lagpas sa 1 meter better pero hindi po dapat tayo mas uh, maikli doon sa 1 meter na nire-require ng batas. Uh, proper disposal ng waste, okay? Lalo na yung mga face mask, ibalit po sila sa plastic bago itapon. Of course, dapat may segregation. At dapat laging kinacheck din yung canteen at saka yung kitchen po ng uh, establishment natin. Okay? Then, uh, minimize, how do we minimize contact rate? Okay? So, mag, ano po tayo? Mag-implement ng skeletal workforce. At, a, at maximum na po itong 50% ano, at any given period. Pwede po tayo mag-staggered, no? Kung 100% ang papapasukin natin, pwede in two shifts po sila. Okay? Pero as much as possible, the dinner, the better. Kung pwede naman mag-work from home, uh, we, we advise na mag-implement po ng work from home arrangement. Yung mga meetings po, dapat ginagawa po yan ng maikli lang at of course, minimum din yung number of participants. Uh, when we say short duration, uh, it should be 15 minutes or less. Pagka marami na po yung participants na inaasahan natin, uh, video conferencing, pwede siyang pong i-consider po no? pag mahaba yung meeting. I-minimize din po natin yung interaction with clients at of course, uh, pagpasok po sa mga elevators at sa mga close areas, dapat uh, ino-observe pa rin natin yung social distancing at of course, sa kumpanya, uh, iniwasan din natin no? na bumiyahe sila ng bumiyahe kasi of course, mahirap dahil sa uh, posibilidad na ma-expose sila sa uh, sakit na ito. So, why OSH po? Bakit po natin kailangan magpatupad ng uh, occupational safety and health sa ating pong mga workplaces? Of course, na improve yung working conditions ng mga workers. Pagka maganda yung working conditions nila, alam nila na safe and health, healthy sila doon sa lugar nila, nabubush yung moral po nila, no? yung anxiety nila uh, na-address. Uh, it sustains, maintains productivity dahil wala silang alalahanin, nagiging productive po sila. Of course, na-enhance din yung company's reputation at uh, yung credibility nila and of course, yung competitiveness. And lastly, it achieves harmonious relationship doon sa workplace po. So, ang summary and conclusion po natin pagdating po sa, sa, ano po, sa occupational safety and health, mayroon po tayo enough legal basis to implement this. Of course, our health and safety ng uh, mga manggagawa, it's everybody's responsibility. Tripartite po yan, government, employers, and employees alike. No? Meron po tayong responsibility to implement OSH. OSH is not one-size-fits-all policy. Of course, it is, it is, encourage po namin kayo na mag-develop ng inyong sariling policy. But, of course, it should adapt yung mga applicable provision po sa batasan no? at kung magdi-debate tayo ng kaunti of course we need to ano you need to inform us to assist you okay OSH implementation is a must in this new normal okay so kalimutan niyo na po lahat ng sinabi ko po kanina wag niyo lang po kalimutan itong mga contact details po namin dito sa screen po namin kasi of course maaring sa question and answer natin mamaya hindi namin o hindi nyo maitanong ang lahat na mga gusto nyo itanong. At least po dito, marami po tayong avenues para po makapag-connect po kayo sa amin. Muli, magandang hapon po muli sa atin pong lahat. Thank you, Dr. Valeros. Our current situation made us look at health and safety from a very different perspective. It is reassuring to be reminded that it is in the law that workers have the right to demand, to be educated, and to be provided with a safe working environment before, during, and after the pandemic. The DTI DOLE guidelines on workplace prevention and control of COVID-19, which was the basis of NLEC PH's reopening guidelines, confirms and reassures us that resuming work with our safety prioritized is possible. But this doesn't mean that as workers, we are not responsible for the safety of the workplace. Safety is everyone's responsibility. The government, employers, and employees have roles in ensuring everybody's well-being. I hope that Dr. Valeros's presentation inspired you to reevaluate your company's occupational safety and health programs. If you haven't yet, register your establishments and develop your own safety programs. You may reach out to Dole for guidance as you update your own safety programs. If you have clarifications or questions that you want to raise, type them in in the comment section and we will try to address them later on in the program.
Like NLEC PH Secretariat Facebook page for updates on the industry and the upcoming web series episodes after this one. For those who are just tuning in, this is the first episode of NLEC PH's web series. In our first discussion, the Department of Labor and Employment reviewed the safety guidelines for the workplace and the occupational safety and health standards. Now we go to our next topic for discussion in relation to Dole's presentation. We are joined by the Department of Health to talk about the minimum health standards that must be observed to mitigate COVID-19, especially in workspaces. Our next speaker serves as the Chief Policy Advisor to the Secretary of Health on UHC implementation, develops strategies to catalyze reform initiatives, ensures alignment of reform initiatives between the DOH, PhilHealth, and attached agencies, and engages in various stakeholders to facilitate uptake of UHC policies, plans, and programs. Please welcome Medical Director 4 of the Health Promotion and Communication of the Department of Health, Dr. Beverly Lorraine C. Ho. Hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of the DOH, um, thank you for giving us a platform to further our collective work on minimum health standards, our tool to keep us healthy and safe while there is no vaccine yet. Allow me to use this opportunity to highlight three important things. First, we need to adapt to a new lifestyle, a new mindset, one which requires heightened vigilance. Second, we should not feel helpless because we know what works. There is evidence of what can protect us and what, the, what does not. Wearing masks protects us 85% of the time, physical distancing by 82%, face shield or eye protection by 78%. And for that 15 to 22 percent of the time, let's stay home so we don't um, unduly expose ourselves. But, but what if we need to do to work? That's where my third point comes in. We want to restart the economy and to be able to successfully do this, we all need to make going and being at work safe so that our opening is going to be sustained and not bumpy. To do this requires um, us to keep in mind that some people are more at risk, some areas are more at risk, and some activities are more at risk. Recognizing that events with a live audience are considered um, to be a high-risk activity because of the duration of the activity, the number of participants, the nature of the, that the activity entails. Hence, we are happy to have collaborated with DOLE, FDCP, and NLEC on the guidelines which was based on DOH AO 2020-0015 issued way back in April. However, it is also important to highlight that the intent of such an issuance is not to put us all in boxes, but basically to serve as a basis for organized groups like yours to customize it to their specific industries, building on the minimum specified in the JAO. Feel free to step up but not step down from the minimum standards. I'd like to end by quoting a medical anthropologist from Johns Hopkins University. She said, people will change their behavior if there are three conditions in place. They know what to do, why to do it, and see other people like themselves also doing it. My appeal to everyone in this webinar, magtulungan tayo. Let us make the environments um, conducive for our people to practice the healthy behaviors. Let us innovate continuously. And finally, let us motivate each other to be role models wherever we are. Let us be the solu solution to COVID-19. Thank you very much. Very much for that, Dr. Ho. It's a very interesting discussion on the minimum health standards that must be in place, especially in the workplace. In her presentation, it was mentioned that protecting everyone's well-being is shared accountability, meaning it is not the government's sole responsibility or neither is it the employer's. Everyone in the community must take accountability for safety. Now, to understand the safety guidelines and protocols and keep updated on the COVID-19 mitigation, you may check out the websites of the Department of Health, the World Health Organization, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Again, this is the NLEC PH web series. Just to recap, earlier we had Dole discuss the occupational safety and health standards and guidelines for employers and employees as they the live events industry gradually returns to business. DOH laid down the minimum health standards that must be observed in both offices and event venues to maintain both workers' and audiences' safety.
Take a look at the summary of the key points of the two presentations. For instance, for sources of information for laws, you can refer to Republic Act 11058 and the IATF. For standards, we can refer to the Bureau of Working Conditions, the Occupational Safe and Health Standards, and Joint Administrative Order. Of course, there are also codes that you can refer to. You can refer to the Labor Code, the Fire Code as well. In terms of guidelines, you can refer to NLEC-PH Safety Guidelines. As for employer guidelines, you can refer to Health Safety Security and the Environment Plan and Event Safety Plan. And the first part to safety is, of course, education. It's educating. And the next step would be to address the, the points in complying to safety. If you don't know what to do, how do you stay safe? You have to create policy and procedure. Now, some people, they don't understand why these safety protocols have to be in place. What's important to do is to educate. Again, as we said, you have to do training. Now, sometimes some people, some establishments don't necessarily have the tools, what they need. You need to provide resources like equipment and proper PPEs. Now, sometimes people will feel like it's a discomfort to them, let's say to wear a mask. Why do I need to do it? You have to make consultations available so that they will understand the exact reasons why we are doing these things, especially during the time of a pandemic. Now, it takes more time for these things. It's not the usual thing because, again, the pandemic is one of these things that it's out of our control. Now, you have to schedule management. You have to understand why we need to do these certain things. Now, some people are very averse to change. What can we do? We can help them by perhaps coaching them and making them realize that this is practically the new normal for us. Now, if you don't like being told what to do, like many of us maybe, <laughs> you need open communication with employers, with employees, and I know that a lot of protocols from government are in place to educate everybody as well. Now, if you simply don't want to, that's already a question of self-discipline. There are fines and penalties in place, so we need to sort of, you know, know that these are the things that we need to do at this point. Now, those were very insightful presentations from our guest speakers. I know you might have some clarifications that you'd want to ask them, so type in your questions in the comments section. We will try to answer them now. At this point, we'd like to welcome back Dr. Beverly Lorraine C. Ho once again. And joining Dr. Ho is the Chief Labor and Employment Officer of the Bureau of Working Conditions of the Department of Labor and Employment, Mr. Nicanor V. Bon. Thank you for joining us. All right, so let me start the ball rolling with the first question. How do we find the balance in prioritizing worker safety and health and at the same time continuing with business operations? Because this is the check and balance that, you know, when it came to ECQ, the, you know, eco e economics, the work. Did the consultations with us on this. Um, why is this important? Um, we know that there's no vaccine yet, so there's no way to prevent um, us from having COVID. No, that that's that natural immunity that we should have, or acquired immunity from a vaccine, um, rather. But with minimum health standards, it's actually a set of protocols that includes, say, what individual behavior would be, uh, but also what is the responsibility of the establishment in making sure that the area or the workplace is actually conducive, no? Um, so the minimum health standards is going to be um, a collective effort of us as individuals, the employees, the, you know, the people who will be going to the event, but also by the establishment hosting the event. And needless to say, sabi ko nga kanina, diba? when you go to and from an event or to and from your workplace, then the transportation also has to be safe. No? So in that case, the national government has also put in place mechanisms for that. You will see our LRT, 
MRT stations, they're all being um, um, modified in order to accommodate this new, um, this new setup. So I would say that it's going to be hard because it's not as simple as, okay, let's buy something and put it in place. It's not that. The minimum health standards will really require change in behavior from every one of us. So no one can say, oh, it's because my employer wasn't able to do it. Oh, because the organizer of the concert wasn't able to do it. We all have a role to play in making sure this, um, this transition is facilitated. Um, and so what we have produced, along with several other government agencies, are guidelines for which the private sector, the employers can start um, applying and even improve it further. But at this point, you know, a lot of offices are opening up. And again, as we said, apart from the event space, it's also the offices of, of all of the, the people who are coordinating all of these events. Now, are employers required to provide COVID testing for employees before resuming business as we are slowly starting to get back into that? Or can workers demand their employers for testing? So our national government policy is it's not a requirement to get tested prior to going back to work. No? And the medical professionals have all um, endorsed a guideline, which is what they call the 14-day test, right? It's a 14-day symptom test. So basically, once you're going back to work, you get asked whether in the last 14 days you have had symptoms. And if you've had symptoms, then you'll have to wait out a 14-day quarantine period before you start going to work. Otherwise, if you're symptom-free the last 14 days, then you're free to go back to work. So there's no requirement for you to go uh, to, to have testing prior to, get, to going to work. Um, however, um, it's only going to be mandatory for you to get regular testing if you're part of, say, a healthcare workforce wherein you'll be constantly exposed in the line of duty. Then there are guidelines on the frequency of how, um, how often you're going to be tested. So frontline health workers, but not all of them, at least those who are caring directly for COVID-19 patients, um, most of them are going to be required like every 14 days to have their test done. Well, a lot of companies have also chosen to sort of split the workforce. Some people will be going to the office, so there are less people involved. And a lot of people will still be or have chosen to still work from home because it is something that they are allowed to do at this point. Now, is the DOLE DTI interim guidelines on workplace prevention and control of COVID-19 also applicable to the work from home setup? So I, I would say principles wise, you can apply most of it, no? So you can work from home, but your home is also a setting, right? Wherein you have family members coming in and going out. And if possible, the principles um, underlying all of these minimum health standards are basically the same, no? So wearing of masks, physical distancing, frequent sanitizing, um, and then making sure that anyone, whether in workplace, at home, in public place that has symptoms, immediately has to isolate himself or herself. But with a virtual office as well, how can you check if it's DOLE compliant? Well, first of all, um, it really depends what type of work we're talking about, right? So if you're saying um, at home you have a computer screen and you're doing a certain um, you know, video editing, etc., then you have very minimal requirements to fulfill, right? But then if you're talking about working from home, but congregating some of the workforce at home, then it might be uh, more challenging to actually um, regulate that, no? And that's why we need other partners to help us regulate, no? So the National Government Agency cannot go and and, you know, every day check up on everyone. And so part of this is actually a lot of social responsibility. Um, we have asked in the JAO to submit certain reports, right? And that's part of what we want most of the national, um, most of the private sector and even some public sector agencies to do, you know, submit reports, at least especially for highly critical activities. And this is the reason why, because we also need to prioritize what we need to um, inspect and oversee more than the others. Well, as you said a while ago, it's really a joint effort between the government, the employers, and the employees. So what if employees sort of find safety protocol violations within their workplaces? Um, how do they 
how do they report these incidents and can they and should they? I think I will defer this question to Dole. Yes, uh, Lexi, if there are complaints or non-compliance, um, workers may report the same with the nearest Dole office so that uh, the Dole can act on it. And where, where Sir Bond, can they, can they reach out? Dole, is, do they have many offices everywhere? Um, is it best to start online? How do, they, how do they reach the Dole? Yes, they can uh, visit the, the nearest uh, regional, provincial, or field offices. In Metro Manila, we have so many field offices. So they can, uh, they can uh, visit them or they can report, they can call, they can, uh, they can uh, email us or any, any communications. They can, they can do it anonymously or otherwise. They can report to us any uh, violations or non-compliance with uh, the safety and health protocols. Mr. Bon, now that things have been opening up again, um, within Dole, have you gotten a lot of complaints or are we finding that, you know, a lot of the offices are, are sticking to the protocols and they have all of the safety protocols in place? There is an ongoing uh, uh, monitoring inspection uh, in coordination with uh, DTI. So we, we find some, some violations and, of course, we are there uh, to assist companies to comply. So that's the primary purpose. Uh, help them out how they can uh, comply with, uh, with the safety and health protocols imposed, uh, issued by go different government agencies and uh, through the directives of the IATF. And sir, are you finding that a lot of people have really gone back to not virtual offices and not working from home, but back to their actual offices? Or do you find that it's really a, a shift or, or a split between those working from home and those who are actually back to the physical offices? As of now, we have regulations to that. Uh, I, I think that it, it depends on the, the community quarantine, quarantine. like in, in, um, in uh, Manila, in, in NCR, it's, it's still uh, basically 30% in, in, in some establishments. So we have to comply with uh, the directives of the IATF and other government uh, uh, agencies like the requirements of DOH, DTI, etc. So there is really a need to 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 comply to comply with these requirements of of uh, the government. Right, because at this point, COVID nineteen is still not completely known to us. It's still very fluid. The situation we don't know. In fact, like a, a question I'm going to throw to Doc Bev now is about it being airborne, because you know we still to this day are not 100% sure that it is airborne. And if it is, you know, being in an office space, maybe it's not the safest or, you know, unless you have all of the safety protocols in place. So Doc Bev, maybe you can talk to us about um, its airborne capability or if it's not conclusive yet. Okay. So there are basically five modes of transmission that we're talking about for any particular infectious disease. And so far, what we're sure about, meaning we have concrete evidence, are three, you know, so um, direct contact, so that's kissing, hugging, right? And then next would be um, droplet transmission, which is what we know, like when you cough, when you sneeze. Um, and the third would be um, touching of uh, frequently touched surfaces, right? So you touch someone um, with, with the virus and, that, and you touch that place. Uh, so um, basically we're very sure of these three things. What are we not sure about? Airborne transmission and um, fecal oral transmission, meaning if someone ate it and then it went through the water, whatever. No? So those two things, we still have no solid evidence. But at this point in time, six months into um, you know, finding out about this virus, what we're sure of is that we can't rule out anything, right? So it's still possible at the end of the day, you know? But what we're talking about is if we have evidence of the first three modes of transmission, then we're sure we can protect ourselves from the first three. So what have we done? So that's why um, even before WHO actually recommended wearing masks, we already um, um, recommended it as a country. What would um, say having certainty that airborne transmission happens, how will it change our guidelines? So basically, I think that's going to be the question. Um, as of this time, 
we know that um, the COVID-19 droplets are big, no? So because they're big, they can't travel far and they can't stay afloat in air for longer periods of time. If they become smaller and smaller, that's when you talk about staying afloat in air for a longer period of time. But the big droplets can already become smaller now in healthcare setting. This is what you read about that, oh, COVID-19 is aerosolized in the hospital setting. And this is why compared to us, regular people going out, we just wear the regular mask or even the cloth mask. In a, health, in a healthcare facility, you actually have them wear the N95, no? Because you already are assuming that maybe there's a form of um, airborne transmission. But that because of aerosolization, no? Parang lumiliit yung mga um, droplets. But in the, in, the, in the setting where we're working, office, outdoors, it hasn't been um, proven pa. So perhaps what will change significantly is the way um, that the, the mask that we will be wearing, it will change because the particles, if they get smaller and smaller, then, the, the, then we have to wear the more fitting mask, no? What else? Um, we might um, significantly change guidelines on ventilation because now we talk about well-ventilated space, aircon is still okay, but we're not being very strict about how do you, how often do you change the filters for these air conditions, etc. No, but these are things that might change if we are going to be very certain about um, airborne transmission. Kaya then we don't want people to panic, no. As long as there's no guidance, we focus on the um, we focus on the initiatives or the protective factors that we are sure about. Because if we're talking about airborne transmission serious implications siya on all of the resources that we're going to be needing. And as of this time, um, there's really no solid evidence yet on it. All and right. Sorry, well, I think my last reassuring point there is that um, in the hospital setting, recent studies have shown that, um, say, for example, in China, they have actually gone for around four months where in, um, in a hospital setting, no healthcare worker has been infected. No. And this has been um, published in a very um, rigorous scientific literature, which just tells us that it's possible to be protected. No, It's possible to have the full set of suit and you will be protected. Well, in terms of the, the workers going back to the workforce, going back to their physical offices, um, it is not. Um, well, the DOH doesn't say that it is necessary to get tested, but in terms of the rapid testing, because it's also a bit controversial in terms of the accuracy of the rapid test. So does the DOH recommend rapid tests for those returning back to work? Mm, no. So we follow the guidelines issued by all of our medical societies, so various medical societies are one in their stand on it. Um, in the DOH guidelines, there is a um, qualitilia that says you can do rapid testing as long as they're validated and of good um, accuracy so that you don't get confused with the results. But as of this time, there are actually no locally validated um, um, rapid antibody test kits no, that are out in the market. So you will really just have to, to in a way, guess or be, be comfortable with the level of uncertainty if you're going to use it. And that's why from the DOH standpoint, um, we know that the employers are also um, cash trapped because of what happened. And so if it's all about um, channeling your resources, you better channel your resources to making sure that the workplaces are, you know, your employees have masks, diba? that they have, you have alcohol in place, you have soap and water, um, you know, lang, no? and maybe flu vaccine also if you want to give benefits. But the reality is the antibody test has little benefit to return to work. Well, in terms of, because we're also talking about with NLEC, we also champion the freelancer. So maybe I can go to Mr. Bond. As a freelancer, how can the DOLE DTI interim guidelines be applied to them? Because if they don't really have any direct employers, how, how will that be able to, to apply to them? Uh, it's it's clear in the joint memorandum circular that even the the so-called talent, the independent contractors are covered so long as he's or she is in the workplace. So everyone, every worker, whether he's dependent or not, uh, is covered. 
by the regulations, by the safety and health protocols. And we, we see a case in point, even the talented, the, 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 our, the, our actor, the, the, the deceased actor was, uh, as a, that's a case in point, what happened uh, to that uh, uh, character actor. So any worker for that matter, with including a freelancer, is, uh, is covered by our safety and health protocols in any workplace. Thank you for clearing that up, Mr. Bon. I think it's very important for the freelancer to also feel protected because sometimes they feel very alone. And it, it's good to know that as a talent, they are still protected by all of these guidelines. Now, again, much as we are in the virtual space and we're doing okay, when do you think, maybe Doc Bev can answer this, when is it safe to conduct mass gatherings? Because right now, you, we're only really allowed to see gatherings of up to maybe 10. I'm not sure if that's that's the correct number at this point, but um, when do you feel that mass gatherings, live events, will will come back to the fore? So what we have um, in our guidelines now, um, in general, yes, um, for GCQ, um, the participants will only be allowed 50% of the venue or seating capacity. You know? So public gatherings, um, not limited to movie screenings, concerts, sporting events, and other entertainment activities, community assemblies, non-essential work gatherings. Um, this rule applies. No? So basically, um, our advice is let's err on the side of caution. If we could have innovative mechanisms to not hold live events um, with um, the mass gathering, then that's actually preferred, no? um, especially because um, you might have a big venue, but the entrance and exit, those are things that you actually need to, to take note of. No? So the, the entire um, parang workflow of the, the people who are going to attend the event. So we're, we're hoping that with um, loosening of our GCQ to MGCQ um, and eventually to even the low risk category, then we might be able to allow uh, mass gatherings. But as of this time, hindi pa po pwede. Okay, so maybe we can just get final thoughts on, you know, because we, we need industry to move forward and we're all here to, to help each other, but still keep the safety protocols in place. So maybe since you're already there, we'll start with you, Doc Bev, on your, your final thoughts on the situation and what we can do to just all help each other out. So thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's been um, supporting um, the work on minimum health standards. I guess what we need to be, we are very humble um, with this entire process. No? This is the first time that the entire world is experiencing this whole thing. No? So there's no formula to this. And so we are also um, slowly putting things in place. And when we talk about monitoring and reporting, the reason why these are in place is because we want to continuously update the guidelines. Right? If you're um, reporting and saying, and we are finding from the reporting that, oh, because we put in these things, because we put these things in place, then we're getting less and less infection, then we can probably relax the guidelines further. But if we don't have those data, then it will be difficult for your government to act on it, diba? Right? Because at the end of the day, our job is to make sure Filipinos are safe and healthy. So yun lang, I think kasi most of the um, issues that we're getting in terms of um, the guidelines are with regard to um, submitting monitoring reports that it's tedious, but we're finding out now because of the clustering of cases in workplaces, it's actually very, um, very useful for us. Um, also, our epidemiologists who are investigating these cases, na, ah, saan ba yung lapses, no? And what are the common lapses? Para we put in stronger guidelines for those. Ito naman sa wala namang masyadong lapses or um, you know, parang mas acceptable na ilusen, then we will do those adjustments. So yun lang, yun yung more um, appeal namin. And then you, um, the industry leaders who are listening, you know your industry better. And we won't claim to know your industry better. So we're just really happy um, that some of you have really stepped up to make sure that the guidelines are more 
in sync for your um, industry. Yun lang, yung appeal lang namin is step up more than the minimum standards, not um, step down. So yun lang, um, we're always open to feedback, so feel free to to drop us an email and our team will be happy to, to serve you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Doc Bev. Now we can move over as well to Mr. Bon. I mean, Doc Bev was saying exactly that um, there are clusters in some of the in some of the office spaces, right? And at least, um, what what are your thoughts on this, Sir Sir Nick? And how can we also help each other out when it comes to to Dolles from Dolles end? Yes, uh, as as mentioned a while ago by uh, Doctor Mark. Uh, the safety and health of uh, our people, of our workers, is everyone's responsibility. The government, the DOL in particular, is doing its part. So we are also urging uh, companies and the workers alike to do their share. Like uh, the, the companies, uh, we need the safety officers to do uh, their responsibility. The, there should be a safety and health committee to monitor uh, the safety and health the programs of the company and the workers as well should comply with the, the rules and regulations pertaining to these protocols so that would be all all right with that we'd like to thank again our speakers mr bond and dr beverly ho for joining us in this first episode of the nlec ph web series now dole and doh have confirmed and reassured us that live events are on their way back we are equipped with the necessary guidelines that shall help in making sound decisions for your next event. With that, the only next step for us is to get back out there with these new types of event productions, virtual event production, multi-platform event production, and soon hybrid event production. The live events industry is continuously innovating given the challenges we are facing today. It is in our core to venture new ways of making experiences possible. And as we face the biggest drawback, the industry remains hopeful and creative despite it all. We are in the business, after all, of live experiences, but as we wait for our time to celebrate together once again in the flesh, we extended our stages to virtual platforms to continue what we do best. Now, in the recent months, we've witnessed, attended, or even some of you have mounted virtual event production. This event produced and attended purely online, like this web series. Now, nothing can really substitute live experiences, but virtual event productions make it possible for people to gather and celebrate in the digital sphere. Next up is the multi-platform. Allowing video shoot productions was a big win, not only for the video and film industry, but also for us. Following FDCP's Joint Administrative Order 001 enabled us to mount multi-platform event productions, even that are produced, well, events that are produced and shot on a physical venue and then broadcasted for the online audience. So that's the second type. And next, we are going to see a hybrid. Soon, when audiences are allowed to be back in our event places again, we can have audiences both live and online. This is called the hybrid event production, live and virtual combined. Having these options create more opportunities for event agencies, organizers, producers, suppliers, talents, and freelancers to, of course, bounce back. Now, to go into detail about how live events incorporated FDCP's JAO 001, let us all welcome Film Development Council of the Philippines Chairperson and CEO, Ms. Lisa Dino. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for joining us. There you go. Thank you, Lexi. On behalf of the FDCP, I'd like to thank NLEC for the opportunity to share with our viewers the wisdom on how the DOLE FDCP DOH Joint Administrative Order was created and how NLEC had become very, very instrumental in expanding the coverage of the JAO to allow more sectors within the audiovisual industry to resume operations. I'll take you back three months ago 
On April 20, the Film Development Council of the Philippines hosted the AV Industry Stakeholders Town Hall via Zoom with the theme, Economic Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic to the Film and Audiovisual Industry, Survival, Recovery, and Shifting to the New Normal. We had a close to 100 attendees, making it one of the largest attendance of an FBCP-hosted AV industry meeting with representatives from uh, production, distribution companies, creative guilds, institutions, fundraising groups, film festivals, content platforms, and government agency. It was actually an opportunity to understand that the film and audiovisual industry is a big industry and that there are a lot of allied sectors that are working within this um, parameter. So holding the virtual uh, town hall was an excellent way to introduce the AV industry to government agencies as well. As mentioned by um, uh, Congressman Toff, this is actually um, uh, an, um, an amazing um, opportunity now for a lot of different government agencies to see that uh, the audiovisual industry is very big. Uh, led by, of course, Kong Toff de Venecia, the AV uh, industry engaged with the Department of Labor and Employment, Department of Health, DSWD, DTI, Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, uh, DICT, or the Department of Information and Communications Technology, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Of course, among the urgent concerns of the AV industry that needs to be addressed are the policies for production shoots and barrier me measures during live events. And during that time, the DOH already presented a baseline um, protocol on how we are going to um, help industries reopen. So there was actually um, a baseline protocol for cinemas um, and live events and a baseline protocol for the film shoots. So this was actually a good um, uh, start for us to streamline uh, the certain protocols and health standards uh, through more consultations and discussions. So it, the industry's uh, stakeholders town hall was one of the first of many discussions within the industry. We had succeeding pocket meetings that will not just tackle how to overcome COVID-19, <laughs> but to really talk about um, how to incorporate proper working conditions with these protocols. And this is how the Department of Health, the Department of Labor and Employment, and the FDCP work together. On June 7, 2020, the Department of Health, Department of Labor and Employment, Department, and the FDCP released the Joint Administrative Order on the health and safety protocols for the conduct of film and audiovisual production shoots and audiovisual activities during COVID-19 pandemic. The JAO is a tripartite government issuance that sets the minimum public health and safety standards that production shoots must abide by in order to ensure that all film and audiovisual content workers are protected as operations resume during the pandemic. As line agencies cover all sectors, as mentioned a while ago by DOH and DOLE, the FDCP cooperated with them uh, and, it, and we served as a participating agency in providing context, inputs, and recommendations on the health and safety <laughs> guidelines governing film and audiovisual production activities. Because of this JAO, when it was released, live events found an opportunity to actually high, um, high, um, migrate and transform their usual live events into multi-platform events. And I remember that we had this meeting with NLEC and they are saying, how can we fit into the JAO? Because this is an opportunity for our industry to actually restart, even if MGCQ pa lalabas or magkakaroon ng opportunity para mag-open uh, ulit ang live events. So um, uh, we consulted with our agency partners on how we can um, contextualize or ex expand the coverage of uh, the uh, audiovis uh, of the JAO to cover the live events industry. So on June 27, with a goal to clarify and allow the sectors within the audiovisual industry to resume operations, as well as reiterate the salient points in the JAO, the FDCP released advisory number six. So this allows for a contextualization and an expansion of the coverage of who can actually make use of the JAO so that they can already resume operations. So just to put context on the, the, the responsibilities of the different agencies in terms of uh, the JAO, the DOH is in charge of updating and communicating 
communicating basic health and safety standards. The DOLE is at the helm of inspection, penalties, regulation to make sure that there is um, uh, compliance to the provisions of the joint admin order. The FDCP's role is to man the project registration and coordinate um, the production details to uh, the different uh, production registration forms submitted to us to LGU's DOLE and the DOH. So while FDCP recognizes that it covers only the film industry, DOLE and DOH covers all sectors in terms of the implementation of their mandate. And sectors outside of the film industry with similar parameters on the conduct of production shoots and related activities are covered by the GEO. Um, the monitoring tool that we used in um, making sure that um, mm -hmm. it's not going to be as tedious mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all the forms will be funneled into one central for, uh, into one central document, FDCP created the Safe Filming Program. It is in partnership with the DOLE and DOH that will um, take the strategies and guidelines of the FDCP GEO and create a global resource website that outlines the principle of safe production and provide information about systems, resources, forms, and all related documents and issuances to ensure working safely in Philippines for both local and international film productions. It will also be a platform for an active collaboration with stakeholders to share best practices and updates, especially with a cost, constant assessment and management of uh, risks of infection transmission. Regardless of the format, film, TV, show, advertising, as long as workers are physically present in a production site to shoot content, they must subscribe to the JAO safety and health guidelines. It does not cover the online uh, video conferencing meetings that takes, that takes place in Zoom or uh, Skype and other platforms or uh, vi virtual events uh, that involve people interacting in a virtual environment rather than meeting in a physical location. This is an evolving situation. The agencies... Um, especially kanina narinig nyo sila, we are here to ensure and we are here to assure that the film and audiovisual industry, um, uh, will uh, all of your concerns will be um, heard by these agencies. The goal for us is to work mm -hmm. together and to understand the provisions of the JAO so that we can really ensure the safety and health of our workers. Um, FDCP is always welcome to your suggestions and we are welcoming proposals for an even more comprehensive set of guidelines for the protection and welfare of the film and audiovisual industry, workers, and the families involved. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that, Miss Lisa Dino. Thank you so much for helping NLEC-PH because you seem to have all of your systems in place so we can definitely um, make use of it. So thank you very much for that as well. Now, as of today, Live Events Industries Joint Administrative Order allowing us to operate is still in the works. But for the meantime, in partnership with the Film Development Council of the Philippines, event agencies are following FDCP's JAO 001 to mount virtual event production and multi-platform event production. Joining us in our discussion of what are the possible events now are NLEC members who have successfully mounted virtual and multi-platform event productions following safety protocols. Let's now welcome freelance production manager and partner in FOH event logistics handling, security and safety setup, Arlene D. Ko. Hi, Arlene. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. We also have lighting designer Shakira Villa Symes. Hi, Shakira. Hello, hello, good evening, everybody. With us also is audio engineer and vice president of Force Inc., that is Justin Santos. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all. Hi, Justin. And finally, we have the founder and president of the National Event Safety Association, Rico Santiago. Thanks for being with us, Rico. Good evening, everyone. 
And also joining us once again are the guest representatives from the FDCP and DOLE. Hello again to Ms. Lisa Dino and to Mr. Nicanor Bond. Thank you so much for staying with us for this panel discussion. So at this point, um, we just like to ask all of those who have come up with, with virtual virtual events, how how from from inception to to actual staging, what some of the challenges involved, um, how was your process and was it was it very, very successful? Anybody can take the floor. Can I start? Sure. Yeah. Arlene, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. The last, uh, the, fir- the last one we did was actually a virtual launch. It's, it's a multi-platform. We had the live streaming at the same time. We had the uh, re- pre-recorded interviews that we uh, did in, uh, in a big venue. It's actually a uh, Wego launch. We just did it last uh, June and there. Uh, we have coordinated this with uh, FDCP as well and the NLET group and it was a successful one. Rico was there with me. We did the, I was actually part of the safety implementation and Rico is our uh, safety officer in charge at the time. So Rico, was it difficult to get all of the safety protocols in place? Because from what I remember from all of the other events that we used to do, perhaps safety wasn't necessarily top of mind. Yes, it was uh, actually most of the corporate shows before before this new normal thing. It was not they don't really do security like we just do launches on our own. We do it in hotels, we do it in venues. Security and safety is uh, not actually a part of it, except if there are hotels who require it. But um, now, since because of this, we have actually Rico and I have worked on a safety measure which um, aligned with uh, the FDCP guidelines as well. And um, one by one, we have uh, gathered all the possible uh, information and we have uh, hired um, medical practitioners at the venue. We have security marshals. It was actually, it was not hard because we're used to doing it. Like I've, I've been doing outdoor safety security uh, concerts even before. Uh, the only add-on now is like, we have to add on on the PPEs, we have to add on on the doctors on board and to have to make sure that there's health declaration forms. That, that are new things that we also actually do when we go out. I mean, when we go to banks, we also register now and like before. So it's actually something that we do on a regular basis when we go out. Um, that we just need to uh, make it better when we do events because it's when we do shoots now because it's uh, it's work it's there's this always this thing that makes us feel like we're not safe because it's a virus it's not something that you can see so it's hard uh, it's not really hard on our part because we've been doing it but um, actually explaining it to people I think and the crew to make sure that they are not you know, they're doing it the right way. It makes it harder because siempre, they're not used to do social distancing. They're not used to wearing masks all the, day, all ta- all the time. So that's a, that's a challenge for us, but we worked out well. It's okay. Next. I froze again. Rico, so Rico, what? yeah, Rico, maybe you can share your experience because I guess, you know, everyone's also traversing this new normal um, and we're just all trying to get through it together. Yeah. Um, when we launched the, uh, the, the WeGo uh, about a few weeks ago, uh, Arlene and I worked together uh, practically about a whole week just to, to make sure that uh, everything from the Jiao all the protocols were followed, so we took it step by step, one by one, and then we also added our own uh, additional safety protocols on top of that because we wanted to know, we want we wanted to see that this is going to be a foolproof event. Um, like for example, one of the the ones that we added there was the the changing of the shirts for people that are coming in to do the ingress. Right, uh, they are required as a policy. Uh, to exchange your shirt with a fresh one, 
and to change their masks before they come in. Uh, so they are, we, we have a, a bin uh, where they can throw away the mask, right? And then we will give them a brand new mask so that when they come in and the mask there is only good for four hours. And then after four hours, we actually tell them to exchange. Uh, the other um, problem that I, uh, not, not a problem, but the other additional measures that we took were all the safety team there were carrying alcohol sprays. And we just kept going around and spraying everybody's hands because when you're working and you're busy uh, with the new norm, you tend to forget mm-hmm. about sanitizing. So we just, we just kept walking around and spraying everybody's hands, spraying doorknobs, spraying walls, whatever. We just, just kept spraying, right? Um, so, you know, it, it was successful, right? It was successful and uh, everything, uh, everything went well. Uh, for that event, and I'm looking to improve it more, add more safety uh, to it, uh, and uh, possibly get the numbers down so everybody can start. All right, well, maybe let's talk now to Justin and Sherry. At this point, in terms of conceptualization, because we just talked about what happened on the ground for their event, well, on on the virtual ground for their event, Um, but for the conceptualization, how different it is, is it knowing that it's not going to be a live event, knowing that it's a virtual, and then, of course, eventually the hybrid, that's, that's a whole other, other world. So does it actually um, open up new forms of, of conceptualizing events? As far as my role as an audio engineer, Lexi, um, we had to put on the hat of a broadcast engineer. We're not only mixing for people within the venue to be able to work, but we're also mixing for the broadcast feed for people you don't see. So in a way, it's a little harder um, because you don't see audience reactions. Na parang did that sound good? You just have to make the judgment calls and you have to design your audio in a way that would be appealing to the people watching um, at home or wherever they are. And um, yeah, just being able to adjust to that. Um, has been really cool. Um, I've seen a lot of people in the industry stepping up, sharing their um, talents, their um, knowledge on these matters. And it's re- it really helped a lot of us um, be able to pull off that launch. Got it. Got cut. What a sound. In terms of um, lighting design, it's um, it is very challenging, but it gives you a um, a very creative way. Uh, actually, TV television experience come comes into play when it comes to lighting design uh, because you have to check how the light affects the camera. Um, but it it should really challenge and help inspire. Our lighting designers to play to the to the to the screens. I just want to add, based on my experience, that how the Jow has been very helpful and it really it aims to protect the workers because it it focuses on ground zero at the ingress when everything is at play when everything is being set up. This is where the Jow is really concerned about the the safety of every worker, the safety of every uh, lighting supplier, um, audio person that goes to the venue. I want to stress this out uh, to everybody based on experience from the virtual event I just had, that you have to have the job in place because the, the war starts before the actors come in before every piece of set and uh, every piece of truss and lighting is mounted, the people behind these, um, you know that they will be protected. You know that their names have been given to the production. And you know that the safety officer is there to guide them. Exactly, I mean, safety is, is... yes. Yeah, safety is paramount, um, and and it all starts before the actual show. 
it's there to guide every, um, all the workers. It's there to protect all the workers. And with the proper implementation of these guidelines, I think we can safely mount a lot of virtual events from here on. Uh, if we think about the creativity side of it, we can apply this to theater, whether it's a green screen or uh, we, we, can, we, we can explore a lot of possibilities during this interim solution in this pandemic. I just want to add that the best practice really you know, in mounting the first virtual event was the Toyota Wigo launch that uh, Rico Santiago, Arlene, and Justin were involved in. All right. Thank you very much for that. So at this point, in your presentation earlier, Chair Lisa, you have shared that NLEC-PH asked if they could follow and apply FDCP's JAO 001 for shoots and mounting event. And with that, more and production point. Now, event organizers or agencies use FDCP's JAO 001 in mounting multi-platform events. Will they be under FDCP's regulation? It's very clear that the role of the FDCP is to just collect the project registration forms. So para kaming ano dito, kaming coordinator sa lahat ng mga big agencies namin. So um, uh, they, uh, kami yung frontliner, kumbaga, kasi sa amin sinasubmit yung um, project registration form. Kung merong mga request yung mga live events or meron silang, for example, hindi sila pinayagan ng isang mm -hmm. LGU will be able to actually support and help these uh, productions also. So um, the goal of the FDCP is to coordinate with the different government agencies for the safe um, uh, conduct of the uh, shoots of these productions. So once uh, it's with us, um, since, uh, meron coming back end channel where we um, uh, work with the Bureau of Working Conditions and meron coming um, uh, uh, channel with uh, the DOH. And now we're creating this um, unit with the DIL where we submit um, itong mga um, project registration forms ninyo. So this is important because in the event of an infection or halimbawa merong mag mangyari doon sa mga production um, shoots, um, it's going to be a lot easier for the LGUs to coordinate um, with the different government agencies in mitigating and um, uh, contact tracing, uh, especially yung mga workers natin na iba't ibang location yung shoots. So, um, uh, Imagine different LGUs not knowing um, na in these locations, in those 10 days, nagpunta silang lahat. Uh, isang production nagpunta dun sa lahat sa location na, sa location na yon. And on the 10th day, nagkaroon ng COVID yung isang worker. Wag naman sana mangyari. How are we going to make sure that this is going to be streamlined? So mahalaga na um, pag nasa FDCP yung major or parang master copy, it's easy for us to um, contact or uh, um, uh, coordinate with all of the different LGUs kung saan nag-shoot itong production na to para ma-contact trace natin lahat ng possible na exposed na workers and we can uh, they can proceed with the proper quarantine procedures. So this is our role. It's Our role is not regulation. It's Dolly who's going to do the inspection. It's Dolly who's going to do the insurance uh, uh, ensuring the compliance to the joint admin protocols. Okay. Super so, clear. <laughs> Now, before, let's say before booking and production teams and suppliers, it was somehow easy because you secured the availability, you check the requirements, agree on the terms, and then pretty much you just show up to the event. But now, how is contracting a supplier or talent different from before? Now, were the negotiations more focused on assuring their health and safety during the event? Although before, it should have been a, a requirement as well because really self um, safety and health of, of everybody involved should be top of mind. Um, are there transportation requests or are they just be at work? Do you think that do you, they are also thinking of their safety? Is there anyone to answer? This can be can um, Sir Bon as well of Dole. Yes, yes, of course. Arlene, go ahead. Yeah. Um, when we did the, the launch, um, of course, we have to coordinate with all the suppliers. What we did before, as uh, what Justin also and Rico are aware of, we had to had a meeting with them by Zoom. Like we, had, we called all their supply, all, all the supervisors. And we explained to them all the safety protocols that we're going to implement 
at the venue, like the staggered schedule, like the eating will also be staggered so that, you know, to, to make all the workers be patiently waiting for their turn. Like, because usually it's like going in all at the same time. That's the that's how we use it before, like we're all pressed for time. So the agency, uh, Expedia also uh, helped us to do this because uh, hand in hand, the agency was able to also explain to these suppliers and they were also they also booked the venue like three two days of uh, ingress like usually we do it 1201 until the next day and that's it but now they had to do it two days because of the curfew and then all the other workers which i knew which is part of the event also asked me because they have this hesitation is is it safe but when I explained to them the implementation, the, what, what we're going to implement, that we're going to have an occupational, a doctor that uh, specializes on occupational medicine to be there. We have two nurses who will do um, a thorough physical examination prior to entry. We shared to them the health declaration forms. We shared to them all the step-by-step -step guidelines that we're going to do. And then we also showed them a map where we're going to have like a one-way uh like um, it's it's like a one-way um, traffic flow for everybody. There's this is and then we, when we go ingress, this is and then we actually have a disinfection team that uh, disinfected the venue prior to the ingress. Like I was there at four in the morning just to make sure that the place is disinfected. Even if the venue said they already did their own disinfection, we had to make sure that it's actually, and then we had the disinfection team stay the entire time so that everybody coming in, even all the equipment coming in, even if um, uh, the suppliers already disinfected them, which they showed us in video. We asked them to just send us all the videos to make sure that they also disinfected prior to load in. When they arrived at the venue, we disinfected again the equipment. So everybody felt safe. They, there was hesitation at first when we, they didn't know what's going to happen. Are we safe? Are going to be safe? But when we explained it to them, this is what's, what we're going to do, they felt safe. Even when they arrived there at the venue, they felt safe and they don't feel that they're, they're going to get sick after. Right. I mean, I guess communication is really key. Everyone just has to be um, aware of what exactly Exactly happening, but it was mentioned in the interim guidelines on workplace prevention and control of COVID-19 of the DTI and DOH that it is up to the discretion of the employers to mandate rapid or PCR testing before resuming work. Now, did you and your team undergo testing or is anyone going into the venue um, required to take a rapid test in, in these cases? Alexi, I could answer that one. Arlene, you, yes, sure. Justin, you can go ahead. Yeah. So um, I work for a company called Force Inc. And although it was not mandated by the security plan um, to do rapid testing, we did rapid testing on our employees before we did um, this project. As mentioned by Doc Bev earlier, it's not a 100% gold standard because that's for the um, PRC testing. However, rapid testing will not let us know that, okay, that person might have had COVID in the past. Therefore, um, we can ex exclude him from the risk of like transmitting it should he or she be um, contagious still. So aside from that, we cleaned our equipment in the warehouse before leaving, um, and it was cleaned again upon entry. I was really surprised even um, when we got there. like They had the doctor on standby by the um, entrance of the venue, and you were really not allowed by Rico's marshals to go in without going through that doctor first. So um, what happened actually was that we I had crew that was sent home. They were sent home not because they were contagious for COVID, but because their blood pressure was high that day. So even as simple as that, they were looking into, na, okay, may ubo ka ba? Um, how do you feel today? Do you think you're fit to work? Nahilo ka ba? Gutom ka? And all that stuff. And I think that's the kind of safety that we need in the industry. It's more of a holistic um, safety procedure rather than just the safety that... Um, we've come to implement in the industry. So all of this actually brought about a lot of good and positive change for the industry. As Arlene mentioned, we had ample time to set up the event. And as such, we were not tired. Um, and we know that if you're tired, that's when you, your immune system goes down. That's when you can catch a cold. 
and other sicknesses. Um, we also added like different protocols as far as doing our jobs. So as sound engineers, we handle the microphones of talents and the like. Back in the old days, it's easy for somebody to share a microphone. But now, since there could be like laway or droplets in the mic, we made sure that mics were not labeled just one, two, three, four. It was labeled per name of the host so that that microphone would only be used by that specific person. And then after using, we, 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 were, we made sure to wipe it down. And if you go back into the event, you also see a, like a big panel. Like there were eight, there were eight people from the Toyota management. What we did there, para nobody touches their microphones, we wrapped those mics in plastic pa before using. Tapos it was only when those people came in there that we removed the plastic bags para we know that it's safe. Na nobody went like up to the mic and then talked on it and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I'm really positive in believing that the industry can adapt to change. We all understand the risk, don't get me wrong. Like, um, it was a matter of weighing the economical and the um, safety aspects of this thing. On one hand, you want to be safe. But on the other, let's face the reality that people are going hungry in their homes. And we have an industry to revive. Yeah. Exactly. Because it's always um, it's always a question of the balance. Because it's a balance of making the economy start up again. And making sure that everybody is safe in the process because we don't really see, um, we, we do see surges in cases on a daily basis. And we just want to be sure that everyone's safe. Now, um, Mr. Bond, you've, you've heard from Arlene, you've heard from, from Justin, from Rico um, about the protocols that went through in terms of their particular events. Um, what other safeguards or protocols can you suggest in terms of you know making sure that everybody is safe whenever there is a live event that does happen sir bon yes i would just i would just like to share existing laws like the occupational safety and health uh, uh, law because it's in there uh, uh, the recreation as mentioned a while ago that there should be a safety officer there are health personnel required so therefore there's a safety and health committee uh, organized. So it's actually, that would depend on the risk involved in the workplace uh, as well as the number of workers. So that's why we cannot just uh, have uh, one fit all, all regulations. That's why it's important that the workers, the safety and health committee, discuss among themselves and try to come up with a customized program for their workers. So we cannot say that it's a different, we all know that uh, the industry is unique, peculiar. So that's why it's important that the workers, the, uh, there is a creation of a safety and health committee wherein it, it, is a, it, a, uh, it involves representative from the employer, from the workers, and they discuss and talk about it. What's the proper uh, protocol that should be implemented in the establishment? So that's what I would like to emphasize. The safety officer should be actively involved, should monitor this, the OS program. There should be OS program customized to the need of the company. So it's not uh, for us to, to determine it. It's up, actually up to the company based on their, their OS program. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, another question before work resumes, it is stated in the JAL 001 that as well. Why is it mandatory to provide reports to FDCP in terms of mounting events? I mean, because obviously you're the, the streamliner. You're the one that, that sort of helps handle the situation. So why is it necessary for, for these um, reports to be given to FDCP? Is this uh, for me? Uh, okay. Yep. So um, in uh, February 7, uh, nagkaroon ng uh, joint memorandum circular with uh, FDCP and DOLE in creating uh, minimum working conditions standards for the audiovisual, uh, the film and audiovisual industry. This is a landmark agreement because we all know that in the last, we're already celebrating our hundred years of Philippine cinema, and um, talagang um, uh, siguro I would say that dahil self-regulated, nagkaroon tayo ng entrenched uh, culture of um, uh, um, where substandard working conditions has become a norm. So um, this was really an opportunity 
to institute reforms. And we're so happy that Dole um, created and helped us in drafting this minimum working conditions, uh, standards for working conditions for the film and audiovisual in industry. And including, uh, in include nila doon yung repertorial requirements. Because, um, sabi nga ni Sir Nick kanina, um, paano makakapag-inspect at may ensure na ang lahat ng productions ay sumusunod sa standards na ito kung hindi natin alam kung nasaan sila. So, for example, yung nangyari kay um, Sir Eddie Garcia um, uh, with that, um, had um, all of these um, protocols and standards have been in place, it would have been a lot easier to make sure that um, uh, the productions are following um, merong safety officer, maraming mga nangyaring wala at hindi present doon sa productions na yun. So, very important yung repertorial requirements. It has already been existing in the DOLE in terms of its submission. Nag, um, ang nangyari lang ngayon is um, uh, in-apply natin ito dito sa JAO where um, the repertorial requirements is going to be submitted to the FTCP so that we can coordinate and to make it easier for our uh, film and audiovisual industry to coordinate. Because um, uh, we have uh, the op uh, we have the partnerships um, among all these different agencies to um, uh, coordinate and submit to them these repertorial requirements. Okay, thank you very much for that, Lisa. Now, um, for the others who've held the multi-platform events, were there contact tracing forms or health declaration forms? In, in what you did, and how did the workers receive this protocol? Um, yes, we did. Um, as mentioned a while ago, we have a doctor on duty, and this, they are the ones who actually um, interviews the workers when they come in. And we sent it over, uh, like, the, like the health declaration, we sent it to the suppliers beforehand, so they, they can actually review what are the questions, so they can share it to their workers prior to the ingress schedule. Um, we have act, Rico actually um, uh, asked their um, village doctors um, advice in, in doing the health uh, and safety declaration form before we released it. And we had the meeting, like a constant meeting to check with the client if this is uh, workable. Um, and the workers are fine with it because, as I've said a while ago, we've been also doing it when we enter the mall. We also need to do to do those declaration forms. It's, it's something normal now. Yeah, and so it's already that, part of the norm. Yes, of course, Justin. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. At first, we were like, "Oh, why, why are there like these parang requirements about to check our health?" But then, when you think of it, like parang we talked about it, and then we were like, "Hey, you know, that's a good thing." Like. Uh, Whoa, wow, there's safety people here during our ingress. That's not a common practice um, for live events here. Most of the time, you're just with the production, you're on your own. But now, um, come to think of it, it's a little more dangerous huh, when you're ingressing. Like there are moving stuff. So having those doctors, actually, it wasn't just one doctor. Huh? There was like a doctor and several medical people. Arlene, were they nurses? Yes, they were nurses. Yeah, they were nurses. So parang yun, like you had the full on medical team there on standby, making sure that we're all okay. And I think Arlene said it a while ago as well, that at first people had hesitations, but after a while, I mean, it became common practice already and people got comfortable with, with the whole setup. Yes, I'd yes. just like to add that when you're there, you, have a, you, you tend to forget um, you tend to forget social distancing because you're focused with your work. You're, you're right. more concerned with the technical aspects of the show. You're more concerned with the blocking, with the lines. Um, a safety officer is really needed on site to remind, to remind safe spaces, to remind um, sanitation, to remind where to stand, where to, where to be situated inside a venue. Because once the adrenaline comes in, you, you lose it. You forget. You're also excited to see each other after a long time. And then you're finally in a place together working. You tend to go near your, your, your co-worker. So you forget. And like, oops, hang on. Uh, let's keep distance. So a safety officer is, is really very important. And a safety briefing before the actual ink is very, very important. 
just to add to that go uh, ahead Rico yeah um when when uh, when when we do events right uh, the safety aspect of the health and and safety of everybody is also there but we did not disregard the other safety factors that uh, come with it in terms of the setup like the safety of wearing PPEs harnesses the proper uh, work shoes right all that other stuff was also uh, checked right with everyone if they're using the the right the right equipment to to mount the trusses everything was there um, that went on and then at the same time we had to manage also the social distancing of the crew right we had to make sure that the crew was wearing their uh, PPEs properly that they would not congregate together uh, if they were to congregate that we made sure that um, we would stand by there and have alcohol sprayers on on our hands just to make sure that after they lift something we would spray them again and spray what they lifted so it was um, you know the the health co the covid the safety was there as well as the original uh, set up safety that we always do for for shows. Thank you. Yes, Jim. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I I also want to emphasize that that's the reason also kung bakit yung joint administrative order napaka importante na uh, ma introduce yung mga existing um, OSH laws and incorporated siya sa JAO. Um, yung mandatory presence ng OSH officers are all in the JAO. Kasi a lot of our film workers, a lot of our um, production companies are really not familiar with the RA 11058. Yun yung unang una naming nakita na hindi nila alam that the OSH law actually applies to the production industry, uh, the, the film and audiovisual industry as well. So it was very important for us to reach out to the DOLE so that we can incorporate the tenets and the salient points that are already in the um, uh, do, uh, RA 11058. Kasi even if we are making um, a health and safety protocol for the... Uh, in uh, um, in reference to COVID-19, importante yung existing na um, health and safety protocols in place already in the OSH law. So um, right now, um, na uh, dahil incorporated na siya, yung, yung, industry, or yung mga production companies or yung industry natin na hindi alam na meron palang ganitong mga uh, provisions in the OSH law, Al, na incorporate na nila ngayon as we um, uh, as we comply with uh, the joint admin order and the existing um, provisions right now um, to make sure that all of us are you know resuming productions and working but um, ensuring the uh, safety and health of our workers. Well, I guess I like that's the silver lining as well because now we know that there are safety protocols in place. I mean, of course, now that there's it, it's melded with, with the COVID situation, but now at least alam na natin and we, we comply with it. Someone else wanted to say something? Oh, yeah. So, like, um, I liked how um, Chair Lisa mentioned that there are existing stuff. So, like, they have thick books. Uh. Like, um, Lexi, you can see this one. Mm -hmm. this, this is the manual for um, from Dole. It's the occupational... Um, Safety manual and stuff like that for health here in the Lisa Philippines. smiling. She's happy that you have. Yeah, I have it. a copy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have safety officers. Good student. In, Good student. Yeah, we have safety officers in the company, so that when it comes to like accidents and stuff like that, we're ready. And we also know like the health, um, and the risks involved when it comes to putting up these shows. And yeah, um, I, I like how Rico's team added on the COVID thing to that because we're not operating only on like just a show it's a show during um, a pandemic so yeah i think we had all the bases covered for that one all right well we did talk already about the day itself because a lot of times you know you tend to forget that covid is out there because you're you're not social distancing within the ranks and then you also have um, a lot of the safety officers there but um in the end how did your events go were you practicing social distancing? Um, did the safety officer help in terms of, you know what, guys? I know that we're getting back to normal, but let's let's also still remember that there's a 
Bye, Captain. Yeah. Uh, can I answer it? Go, go. Yeah. Uh, yes, we did. We actually, uh, we, we were strict at the event. We even told the one of the, um, I would say, the top executives of the client that, you know, that they have to practice social distancing. And these were the clients and they understood. They understood and they apologized and we just keep forgetting because it's a new norm. Uh, we walked around a lot, made sure that everybody's more than six feet over there. And if they were to, if they were to engage uh, into, let's say, a small conversation, I only allowed uh, them to stay within, let's say, three feet, but they had the full PPE on, which is a mask and a face shield as well, and they weren't allowed to touch. And we actually monitored all their uh, movements. Uh, if they tend to touch something, we would just follow in the spray. Um, yeah, they were very, uh, they were happy actually. Actually, the, the client was very happy that there were strict measures that were implemented during that, that shoot. Thank you. Yeah, um, and, can um, I add, add on to that too? Um, we also had that acrylic shields in between the control booth area to make sure that, because the control booth is like, um, like you, you can easily talk to another person and you're not you're not aware that you already uh, passed the boundary of that uh, limitations of space. So what we did, we actually had that thing um, in between each so that they, they are aware that they cannot pass to that shield to get to the other person. So we also had that. To my friends in the industry or our colleagues, we're all used to having tight control booths where like we're nearly elbow to elbow with the next person. Here, imagine having a big lifetime table just for yourself and then you have dividers on either side. So it was amazing how we had a really, really long control booth there. Um, it was from end to end of the venue just because um, we had to maintain that distancing. But yeah, um, so yeah, communications like comm sets were really a big help um, for that show because we were like really long. So direction was done through the headsets already. Right. Well, Lisa seems to be happy with all of your, all of your cuento today about your events. But Lisa, in case there are any violations of the Jiao 001 during production, um, who, get, who does it get reported to? Uh Dole will be the one who will implement. Maybe we can ask Sir Nick. Sir um, Nick, maybe you can answer that question. If there are any violations, how how do the how do we report it? Yeah, po tama po si Ma'am Lisa. Uh, any complaints or violations should be reported to us to the nearest Dole Field Provincial Regional Office so that we can act on it. We have existing laws. Uh, I cannot overemphasize that there is a law, the, the Occupational Safety and Health the law. There are penalties if you could not comply with it. So even if there is no jow, there are existing laws. So it's it's important to know that, that we have to have safety officer, as mentioned a while ago by Shakira, and that there are reporter requirements. Otherwise, if you do not comply with that, we can impose fine penalties. So that, that would be it. All right. So finally, let's do our final words. Let, let's hear from everybody briefly, sort of like a post-prod of what you've all gone through. Let's, let's use this as your post-production. You know, lessons learned, um, things that you can do better, and things that you were successful at. Uh, I just want to add with that uh, post-prod, clients are actually proud to show off the strictness uh, in their shows. In, in our event, um, the, the Sun Life, um, it was a Sun Life event. The client was actually proud to see that he had safety officers in place. He, it, it pleased him, it amused him that we have a, a temperature scanner that's um, automated on an iPod. And it, he was really checking things out. So if this is, more supported out there, clients will have an open mind and it's, a, it's an open competition for all who has the best practices <laughs> eventually. Competition us. And Lisa will be the judge. 
Sir Sir Bon will be the judge. Okay, so just your parting shots and your your post prods, um, your assessments and your your highlights. Um, just a one thing, Lexi. Um, with the OSH and IRR, um, maybe we could um, collaborate with the Department of Labor and Employment that we can have a module for pandemic risk assessment for safety officers. So most of the safety officer, um, most of the courses are for mining. Um, if, if we can help fine tune more that it can be industry specific. And we would like to help with that. All right. Well, there is a question from from Congressman of the Venetia to um, to Sir Sir Nick. If ever you can answer this, ask Dole to clarify how live events are categorized in the OSH law. Is it low risk, medium risk, or high risk? Since the mandatory requirements change per classification. Yes, actually, there are uh, the, the the kind of. Uh, uh, there are categories, the so-called high risk, uh, medium risk, low, low risk at this point. Uh, I cannot uh, say for sure what category, but it depends on, on the number of workers. So it's up, actually, we give it back to the employer, the safety officer, to determine what category they belong. So it's actually, that, that's why it's the role of the safety officer is critical. He should know the workings, the, 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 the workings in the company. They should talk with the safety and health committee. So that's, should it go, it should not come from us. It should come from the establishment itself and uh, uh, depending on, on the, uh, the operations. So I will, go, uh, I will uh, return it to, to the company itself to determine once and for all, based on the parameters set by the Oslo, in what category they belong. And considering it's COVID-19 right now, are all industries considered high risk because we have to take those precautions? Technically, I would not say that, but, but there are, are directives like uh, we have to be guided by the directives of the IATF and the DOH and other governments. So at this point, uh, it's, it's really risky now. So that's why... We have to be guided. We have to be. This is an ongoing thing, the, 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 the regulation. So every day, it's there's an update. So we have to uh, uh, keep ourselves with the recent developments, uh, the IATF the directives, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for that, sir. And then maybe we can hear the last words from Rico and Arlene. Uh, Arlene, you want to go? Um, yeah. At the end of the day, uh, you know what I mean. Um, we need to realize that this uh, this is, uh, virus is everywhere. Um, it will be here. It will be here for a while, right? Uh, the best defense for it is actually it's common sense, right? That is your best defense that you use uh, to use. So I just want to remind everybody again, it is real. It is out there. And make sure that you practice all hygiene at all times. Wear your masks, wear your PPEs, right? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Arlene? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that at the end of the day, you have the guidelines. You have the, we're, we're guided already by the government rules and the protocols. Um, it is actually our, we also have to be responsible for self, for our own selves, you know, to keep us safe. And at the same time, to be responsible for others as well. Because um, even if the guidelines and the OSH are there, we should always be um, aware of our surroundings and we should always be responsible for our own selves. Thank you very much. And Lisa, have you spoken already? Have you given your parting shot? Uh, siguro gusto ko sabihin is FTCP is an ally and you have, um, and we're here to help you um, conduct your shoots. Um, we are um, in terms of our mandate kung uh, film industry film industry pa rin po talaga ang aming uh, mandato pero ngayon po is nagpa-participate po kami para matulungan po ang iba pang industriya para makapag-open po tayo and that is the reason why um, FDCP is continuously working with the different government agencies to make sure that um, uh, all of us 
um, we are all intersecting, di ba? Um, iisa po tayong malaking-malaking industriya. And it always changing, it's always evolving. There's so many peculiarities. Pero ang pinaka-bottom line po natin is lahat po tayo, with, whether it is the content sector or the live event sector, magkakasama po tayo dito sa malaking spectrum na to. And that's the only goal of the FDCP, to make sure that kung pwede po kayong mapasama dito sa mga protocols na ito at makapag-umpisa na po tayong lahat, magtutulungan po tayo para dito. And last po, dahil nga ang goal ng FDCP is to just really water down things and make sure that it's easy to understand, please remember remedies. So reduce, modify, distance, install, enforce, secure. Meaning, reduce, limit, up to 50 lang po tayo, and limit working arrangement. Modify, if you need to modify your production schedule, modify your script so that we can fit into the existing restrictions of the government. Distance, no less than one meter. If it's an uncontrolled environment, more than one meter. If it's a close contact proximity, make sure that you have additional PPEs. Install, make sure you have those engineering controls. Kaya ang saya ko po kanina kay Ms. Arlene. Make sure that you have those barriers, hand washing facilities, and foot bath mats so that we can secure um, your surroundings and the workers. Enforce, make sure that you have orientation with the workers. You have your mandatory OSH officers. You are disinfecting the place and there are admin controls in place and everybody is in the know of what they should be doing and how to work around uh, um, uh, in a production shoot. And of course, secure. Wear your PPEs, disinfect the production site before and after. Thank you. All right. Very well said. And with that, we'd like to end this this wonderful, fruitful discussion. I'd like to again Good thank everybody for joining. I'd like to thank Mr. Bon, um, Lisa, thank you very much. Arlene, Shakira, Justin, Enrico. Very dynamic discussion and conversation. And I'm sure everybody has learned from this. All right, so I'm sure that everyone's learned and discovered today definitely worth your time. We hope that today's episode outlined the guidelines that the industry needs to take as we resume our operations very soon. As emphasized in earlier discussions, safety is not a job for one department alone. For us to reopen and pivot as an industry, each stakeholder must recognize that their roles extend to ensuring everyone's safety. We aim to learn and unlearn new in the process as we venture to our industry's new normal. This web series is brought forth to effectively communicate, reach out, and learn together as an industry. This is just the beginning of our learning process. Don't forget to like and follow NLEC PH Secretary. glimpse of what's ahead for us and help us prepare thoroughly for the reopening. Episode two will focus on safety protocols in reopening live events. Episode three is about freelancers, the freelancer's guide to going back to work. For episode four, we've got the multi-platform event, production, concert, a case study. Episode five is the production, a case also have episode six, which is a multi-platform event production fashion show, a case study. And we'd also like to thank once again this episode's partners, Live Events and GLPS Co. Episode partners for... Let's all be inspired and inspire our fellow industry leaders and innovators. It was a pleasure to join you this evening. This has been Lexi Schultz. Thank you, and everybody, do stay safe.